Hey, welcome to the Pharmacy Residency Podcast, a member of the Pharmacy Podcast Network. Um, pretty shocking news coming out of Phase 2, and I'm going to kind of go into this uh, as we kind of talk about it. But uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, the unfilled positions. So in PGY-1, there's 74. Uh, in PGY-2, uh, there's actually quite a few. It's uh, 146 uh, unfilled PGY-2 positions. And that's kind of incredible when you think about you know the competition for it and so forth and they actually made a note saying uh, no ranks were submitted to the match for 132 of the unfilled positions so 28 of the pgy ones in 12 programs and 104 pgy2 positions in uh, 95 programs uh, did not get any ranks so that's saying that even though they were available uh, after whatever discussion happened, uh, they, those applicants decided they would rather not do a residency uh, than do a residency with them. And I think that that's kind of shocking to say that, okay, we've got 220 programs that are willing to pay you to, to do this extra year. And, um, you know, no rankings were, were submitted. So I'm not sure if that's only on one side, like the applicants decided that, or if the Positions themselves said, you know, we, we went through the applicants and we don't really see anyone that that's going to be a good fit for us. So I think the first concern is uh, for the PGY2s next year. Um, when you talk about the number of uh, positions that were offered uh, in phase one and phase two, there were 990 positions. Uh, and uh, then there ended up being 960, you know, afterwards. And then when you talk about those that were filled, it was 814, but that's almost, that's over 10%, about 15% of PGY2 positions were not filled. So it seems to me that, that students are saying, look, I'm gonna do a PGY1, and if the PGY2 makes sense, uh, then I'll do it. But having 135 unfilled positions, or almost 15% of PGY2s unfilled, uh, is going to do something which is uh, it's going to make sure that the quality of those that are remaining uh, is going to be very high and those that did not match this year are going to have to kind of figure out what they can do uh, to be competitive so the tables are turned as it were where uh, it's oh my gosh all these people are going for the the residency and um, they want to get uh, this position, whereas now the PGY2s are saying, oh my gosh, well, you know, 15% of our, our programs are not filled. Uh, we look at the numbers and we see that uh, we're going down about another 7 to 10% in the number of pharmacy students coming in in this fall. So we're going to continue to have fewer students applying to residency and uh, there are going to be unfilled positions. And so now PGY2s have to kind of figure out, okay, well, how can I make a case that a student should do a PGY-2 rather than just take a job after their PGY-1. And again, as the number of PGY-1s go down, this problem for PGY-2s is going to get even worse because there are simply fewer people that can fill those spots. And ASHP just dropped the ability to go into a PGY-2 uh, without doing PGY-1. So let's say you've been doing 10 years of clinical work and you're like, it's silly for me to do a PGY-2 or a PGY-1, I'm just gonna go to PGY-2. Uh, that option is no longer there. And they may have to revisit that because uh, you're going to have you know 135 programs that are saying like, well, what's the point of paying for accreditation uh, if we're not gonna have anybody actually going through the program now there is the scramble and you can continue to contact these programs and so forth but uh, again I, I think that the it's become clear that this advanced training uh, is something that many students are rejecting and we're gonna have to kind of come back and circle back to that now when we look at PGY 1 though we're still have 74 unfilled positions which is a really high number to me uh, but I think that what's happening is, is that, you know, we had many hundreds of students who could have applied to these and uh, for 28 of those positions, uh, those students said that, you know, we're, we're really, uh, we've heard things about this program or uh, the program itself is maybe new or uh, there's something undesirable about it, maybe the staffing or whatever. And uh, the students rejected it and said, no, I'd, I'd rather work and uh, get a job right now and uh, come back next year or not come back ever again. 
and uh, say that, okay, well, I'll, I'll wait till I can get one that I want. And as a, an applicant, you know, if you didn't match this year, your chances I'm expecting are only going to go up as we look at next year. So let's kind of take a look at the numbers uh, and then I'll go into individual schools. But the numbers are kind of staggering when you, when you look at it. Uh, PGY1 matched at 77%. And so that's a 10% increase over last year. Uh, and I can pull up the stats from uh, last year just so I'm not kind of guessing at the number. Um, nope, it's not that one. It's the summary one that I'm looking for. So the, nope, sure isn't. Combined one and two applicants. There we go. Okay, so we went from 65%. Okay, so let's put that next to it. Uh, up to 77%, so an increase of 12% uh, in getting a PGY-1. And then the PGY-2 went from 75% up to 82 so 7%. Now, not as much of a dramatic increase, but the fact that we have so many programs um, that have unfilled positions is just kind of shocking to me. Uh, that those clinical opportunities are there and that students are saying, no, I'm, I'm not interested in doing another year. I mean, I get it. Like you got three, four years of pharmacy school after undergrad and you do PGY-1 and somebody offers you a job, maybe at the hospital that you're at and location-based, uh, then you're going to take it. So I think what you might want to the PGY-2s might want to consider is, do we need to have a couple of more PGY-1s relative to the number of PGY-2s to make that happen? And I think that that's what we're going to see down the line. But let's take a look at the actual numbers, because I think what's most fascinating uh, are the actual uh, numbers. So uh, when you take that Word document, and I, I made it into an Excel file, which is the match rate. Okay, So when we look at the match rate, um, the match rate, I think, has always been kind of a fiction to me, and I'm going to show you how it is absolutely ridiculous in a couple of instances because the match rate does not make sense. So let's look at the first school, I think, ever uh, to get a 100% match rate uh, in the uh, match here. So MCPHS University in Manchester, New Hampshire, is has eight people that went into the match but only four okay and, and let's be very clear about these words uh, because they they use participating in the match as as the terminology uh, it's actually maybe easier to see it uh, when we look at um, I think the not the original document of that one but the residencies and programs so we want the, let me, all right, so we're looking at the number who registered for the match, and those are the people that were thinking about it, and then when you talk about with Drew or did not return any rankings, we're really talking mostly about people that maybe didn't get an interview, and then you've got those participating in the match. So if you go by what most people use as the match rate, which is always higher in general than the, than the uh, total rate, the rate is 100% at this uh, satellite campus of MCPHS, where they four people that got an interview, all four of them matched in phase one or and or phase two. And then the University of Findlay comes next, 23 out of the 24 that got an interview. Okay, but to put those two together doesn't really make sense because what you're saying is, okay, I want to go to a college because I, I admit. I talk to pre-pharmacy students. I want to go to a college that has a good match rate, that I have a good chance of getting a residency. And then you would say, well, okay, well, MCPHS has 100% and Finley has 95. One is 5% or 4% better than the other. But that's if you're looking at this match rate where you're completely just knocking out anybody uh, and worrying about their, um, you know, we just take that column out completely and say, okay, well, we're not worried about those that tried to get a residency in the first place. We're only gonna worry about those that got an interview. And I think that that doesn't tell the whole picture. So I'm gonna unclear uh, that, uh, no fill. And we're gonna look at the top 10 schools that in the match rate, if we were to use the match rate, 
okay, which many use on their websites. And then we're going to look at the number that they would have if we're talking about the total rate. And in general, these are actually usually pretty close together. Uh, but the first one was just so dramatic because it was so few students. Um, that the sample size created kind of an anomaly uh, with that. So we're looking at Manchester and New Hampshire, MCPHS, and if you look at the match rate, it's 100%. But if you look at the number that came in, okay, and so again, we want to use that terminology. Oops, that's not the one I want. We want to use that terminology who registered for the match versus participated in the match. Okay, so eight registered for the match but only four participated, which means that they had to have gotten at least one interview. Now, all four of these people could have just said, look, I've got uh, an opportunity that came up. I decided I'm not gonna go through with residency. No, no worries, okay? So we have no idea what happened to those four people exactly. But in general, it's there, there was no interview and they're off doing something different. But if you look at the, if you put that 50%, the four that matched out of the eight that registered, they rank 113th out of the total rate, uh, which includes 147 schools plus uh, the foreign schools, which uh, always match uh, at a rate of really, really generally pretty, pretty low. And it was um, only two schools matched below the, the foreign school um, rate. So but when we look at Finley, it's, you know, it's like they, they've got the silver medal here, but really they have the gold. Because when you look at the total rate, that is 25 students participated in the match, 24 likely got an interview, 23 actually matched. So you're talking about 92% of those initial 25 are the ones that uh, we should really be looking at. So let's kind of go back to that list and let's look at the top 10. So Finley was really number one. UNC was really number three in both cases. Toledo, although they have a very high match rate at 94%, they were actually 18th, which is still okay. I mean, just a lot of schools. Um, but Pitt, or no, I'm sorry, Thomas Jefferson University in Philly was fifth here, but really should have been second. I mean, of the people that participated, 34, 31 got uh, a residency. Uh, Pitt was right behind them. I don't know what's going on there in Pennsylvania. Uh, and really, the Ohio Valley. I mean, look at that. Ohio, you know, Toledo, Jefferson, um, Philly, and then uh, Pittsburgh. Okay. This one is, is really incredible as well. So you're talking about a school that's, I want to say, three years, has three years of graduates. And the Medical College of Wisconsin, what's special about that is that their school is an offshoot of a medical college. And because I think they have those interactions with the physicians and the hospital and all of that, they have always done well. Even in their first year, I think they were right at the average, uh, but that has continued to go up. So although they are number seven, if you put true match rate, uh, they were still 15th when you look at the, the total. Uh, Rhode Island, again, is number eight here, but really should be number five uh, when you look at the total rate. Uh, and they've always done well. Uh, Nebraska Medical Center, another great one. Uh, these are number nine here, uh, but it would be a little bit lower at 34 if you were to look at the total rate, the number of people that, that wanted it. And then Purdue kind of rounds out this list that was 10 here and 10 there. So what I'm trying to say is that the information that you get from seeing match rate is incomplete. You want to have and understand, okay, what is the match rate, those that got an interview, and then those that wanted to get an interview, okay? And so when we look at those top 10, those are much, much more familiar, I think, uh, than we would say maybe the other ones are. So Finley, Thomas Jefferson are, are the top two, then UNC, Puerto Rico, Rhode Island, UCSF, Wisconsin, uh, those two powerhouses, uh, Connecticut, Wayne State and Purdue again, and then Mississippi right behind it. And then Michigan, Neomed, I think that's Neomed, uh, Pitt, MCW, and then Cedarville. Okay, all right. 
so I'm not sure if you can, I'm, I'm in my office, so there's a lot of people talking behind me, so hopefully it doesn't pick up too much on the on the audio. But anyway, the, the whole point is that when you're looking at matching, when you're looking at uh, residency, that's two points that you want to look at. First, what's their proper match rate? And then what is the rate uh, at which the total rate comes in? The other thing that I think you really want to look at, and you want to do this with NAPLEX too, is there's always this uh, comparison to our regular you know, 100 point scale. And you don't want to look at the 100 point scale because you want to say, okay, well, what's the top 25? Where's that cutoff? And that's at 83.78. Okay, so an 83.78 puts you in the top 25. A 75 puts you in the top half, okay? A 66 puts you in the top three quarters. And then anything below a match rate of 66 point whatever percent or two thirds will knock you, you know, put you down into the bottom 25. So when you're looking at next year, those of you that are P3s, P2s, and P1s, you really wanna take a look at both of those data, match rate and total rate, and see where you're at. The other thing I don't think that we really get a good sense of is, are the residencies, because there is no ranking, um, are the residencies that UNC students and Toledo and Finley and Thomas Jefferson students getting, how much better are those residencies than the ones you know at the bottom? And you know, a residency is not a residency. You know, there's residencies that pay better, have better hours, provide better outcomes. Uh, the residents get jobs at a much higher rate. And there are those that are the opposite. And there's no real way of, current way of, of ranking those and, and letting us know about those. So uh, again, what I would make sure to do is not only find out, okay, what's your percentage? What's your total rate? But also, what are the residencies that they're getting? And then where are those in the numbers? Did they get their first choice, second choice, third choice, fourth choice? And I think that data is really, really what is a huge deal is when uh, somebody gets their first choice from a school that they feel um, was really a, a good value uh, as far as tuition and all those things. So, all right, well, you know, residency season is over, except for those of you that are looking at those uh, 75 uh, PGY1 spots and then 150 PGY2 spots. Um, I will continue to kind of help you as we kind of work through the NAPLEX and MPJE. I've already had a couple of podcast episodes about those. Um, really had a lot of a lot of people join in the pharmacology course, so that's fun. I'll be able to kind of continue with those. Uh, and then if you have NAPLEX questions or you have MPJE questions, always feel free to contact me at TonyThePharmacist at gmail.com. But any of my courses, residency.teachable.com. And I'm going to have a new course soon, which is going to be kind of interesting, which is uh, not only how to help yourself be a little bit healthier, uh, but also your patients. Um, I'm kind of going through my own weight loss journey again, and, and I do this every year where I go from kind of the one low 180s to, to mid to low 170s, but I'm going to try to get to a true athletic weight uh, so I can be very competitive at the grandma's half marathon. So uh, I'm going to go that extra 10 pounds to, to really, really cut down, work on my nutrition, and I think I have a good way of helping you guys and helping your uh, patients as they kind of go through their weight loss journey because we know that when you get rid of that belly fat or that midsection fat that uh, a lot of different markers uh, go down in terms of you know outcomes and things like that so all right we'll talk to you next time